don't lie. Season 4 had a lot of problems. I'm not going to list all of them here. The subreddit did a pretty good job on that. Uh, and that is not the point of this video. The point of this video is to put my money where my mouth is. I've expressed an opinion that I could write a better Luxaria arc. And I felt like it was finally time that I indeed put my money where my mouth is. So, feel free to tell me that I'm a self-righteous bastard in the comments, that I have no right thinking I could do better than a group of showrunners who have been doing this for years, um, that I am a prick and an asshole and an edgelord and all the insults down in the comments below, because that helps the algorithm, even if you hate me. And before I continue, let me also just say that I am not telling you you cannot enjoy the season. If you do... If you, if the Luxury arc was your favorite thing ever, it's, it's, you put it down and you love watching it, I'm not saying you can't do that. I am merely saying that it is flawed, and I am presenting a better execution of the general idea that they had with that arc. So, what are my biggest issues with this arc? Predominantly, it's the fact that it's filler. It's not even good filler. And some people have issues with what filler is. Um, I'm not going to provide a definition, because, for example, in Avatar The Last Airbender, you would have episodes that are basically filler, 90%, but then you would have a little bit here or there with a the character, or they introduce a concept, or they introduce a character that ends up contributing towards the end of the season, or the end of the show, but at the same time, it's a little bit here, a little bit there, and the majority of the episode is unnecessary. You could take that as you wish, as you want, whatever. Um, but no, this arc has none of that. It is absolutely 100% filler. Why? Well, because none of these events are really going to matter. At least they haven't been set up like they're going to matter. Um, Janai and Amaya being a couple, they very strongly hinted that at the end of season three. Sure, they never said, oh, I love you, I love you, darling. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's very, very strikingly hinted. It's not even a ship, it was basically confirmed by a, just look at that final episode. Um, and aside from that, what exactly happens? Well, we get Jinai supposedly securing the loyalty of the Sunfires. That was not in question at all. Season 3 showed that she had basically no one... The only person who ever spoke back to her was her sister, the, the previous queen, who is dead. Um, it was only when they introduced a character like Karam, and literally only Karam, pretty much every other Sunfire elf lockstepped and goose-stepped exactly whenever she said to do it. And Karam was not... I'll get into Karam in a bit, but he was not as good as he could have been. Do we learn anything about the characters? Not really. Pretty much everything we do know, we already knew, aside from the fact that Janai and Amaya are very, very bad people if you look at their actions, like, very bad people. Um, do we learn anything about the world? Kind of, Sunfire cult, we get, we get a glimpse into Sunfire Elf culture, which, the candle thing, I'm not gonna lie, I really, really digged that. Um, as a spiritual person myself, I do believe in heaven and hell and all that. Uh, this concept of um, lighting a fire in the night to guide the spirits to the afterlife properly, that... That was interesting, and I really felt, unlike a lot of people on the subreddit apparently, I felt deep, I felt very connected to that young man who was defending what he viewed as his mother's way to the afterlife. And sadly, she's stuck roaming the endless abyss. Yeah. Um, but it seems like Janai is going to be pushing for uh, less traditionalism, because conservatism bad, don't conserve the past, burn it all down, something, 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 Mao quotes. Uh, well, Sunfire Elf culture, it seems like a lot of the stuff we did get are going to be removed or limited significantly going forward with Janai's reign, which is kind of sad, but eh, you know what you know. So, what exactly does this arc do? What does it add to the season? It adds runtime, boys and girls. It adds extra minutes so they can strength and pull this sloppy, poorly written season to nine full episodes when it could have been done in, like, four. Easily done in four. Maybe three. 
especially if you cut out a lot of season, uh, not season, uh, episodes one and two, which had a lot of filler in them. Yeah. So, what are some of the other flaws? Well, predominantly, by the end of it, as I said, nothing happens. Janai and Amaya aren't separated. There's no, like, schism between them. They're still in love. They're still connected. No one dies. There's no um, shift in the world. Like, you don't have uh, Karam rallying the Sunfires, having a beer hall putsch, and getting them to rebuild uh, Luxaria better, stronger for the second Reich. Or would this be like the third, or maybe the first? I don't know. But you get my point. There's no payoff. There's no sense that anything's really going to change. And speaking of Karam, he ends up being, if you have children in the room, plug their ears, uh, he ends up being a cuck by the end. Because he, he he's pushing this traditionalism. He's a contrast to a lot of the other characters on the show who argue that we need to change and push forward and grow. And he stands as a wall against that. And some people might look at him and go, you're that's bad, but personally, traditions exist for a reason. Um, old ideas exist for a reason. W one of the best and greatest ideas comes from a very, very, very controversial book, the Bible. Thou shall not kill. You, you, killing your neighbors is bad. W would you argue that just because it comes from the Bible, if you disagree with the Bible... Would you argue that, oh, well, we shouldn't, we should be allowed to kill our neighbors because the Bible says not kill? No, you wouldn't. There are certain things that are traditional, that are fundamentally good things. And so, Karam is an example of a person who he views tradition as a, a stand-in. It's a guiding principle. It's a thing that matters. And he wants to preserve that. Possibly because he's scared of going into the world without it. For my um, uh, rural China, my history of rural China course that I'm taking in college right now, uh, we had to read a story about um, uh, effectively shifts in the countryside. And there was a man I can't remember his name, but he was a farmer, and he consulted what was effectively his version of the farmer's almanac, which explained when it was a good time to harvest, when was it a good time to plant, those sorts of things. And he gets mocked by this piece of propaganda. Like, oh, you're so superstitious that you're going to actively hurt yourself. But sit down and think about what he's actually consulting. He's consulting a book that tells him how to effectively farm. In a time when you don't have the internet or you don't have the ability to order food from across the country, you have what you have in front of you. You need to maximize it. And this is a book that has worked for hundreds of years. So why wouldn't it work? Same thing with Karam. He looks to these traditions as they have worked in the past. And sure, there are some, like the duel to the death to establish leadership, that are horribly flawed. But the guiding a spirit, that gives you hope of an afterlife. That drives you to be a better member of your family. Because if your family don't love you, they wouldn't light a candle for you. There's good structures behind what people do in these traditions. And Janai does not seem to care about them. Also, the setup is horribly flawed. What do I mean by a horribly flawed setup? Well, it's been two years. It's been two long years since the sacking of Luxaria. This camp has been built, and people have been living in it for, let's call it a year and a half. And the conflict centers around one of the first things you would think about. A people with an obsession for fire in a camp that cannot be near, that cannot have fire in it. Uh, yeah, no, something tells me that this would have come up so, maybe, just, 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 just a little bit sooner than two years. Let's, let's be gracious and say a year and a half. Like, like, did, did no one think that Hmm, the Shunfire Elves, they're known for fire. That's literally the one thing they're known for. Let's get an architect who doesn't know how to make buildings that can't fucking burn. That's my one F word of the day. 
Uh, yeah, no, that setup was horrible. But I understand where they're coming from. It is a setup to, they're attempting to show that there are good and bad people on both sides. That the Sunfires want to protect their traditions, and that humanity is being very pragmatic in this circumstance. But it doesn't work, because the architect, all that happens is the architect is ignorant of their traditions. In these two years, she never thought, hey, let's have a designated zone so they can do these traditional things to appease their, their family, their dead, their dead kin. So it makes her look like a fucking idiot. Damn it, I said, I said that was my one, okay, two efforts, Susan, I get two efforts today. So, you have, the architect is set up as an idiot who does not care, who either is too stupid to look into Sunfire culture, or is just too uncaring to look into Sunfire culture. Look at the other side. It's a young man trying to do right by his dead mother. Already, we're sitting at one side is more sympathetic than the other. And then, the woman comes and is like, instead of going, hey, let's move the fire, let's move the candle, let's move, let's move it, we can pick it up and move it, she immediately jumps to, hey, uh, that, 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 mo that light to guide your mother into the afterlife, to keep her from running around into the endless abyss, yeah, I'm gonna put that fire out. And then when he calls her out, instead of having empathy, she calls it a, a, su a silly superstition. Now, let's say, for example, this woman is an atheist. We don't really have any looks into the spirituality of the setting, so let's assume that this woman does not believe in an afterlife, let's assume she does not believe in gods, and she looks at this man as an idiot for believing in them. The bastard's mother died recently, and you're going to spit in his face and tell him that his religion is wrong? No empathy. Absolutely no empathy. I am a human supremacist. I believe that humanity is innately more valuable than the life of any elf, dragon, dwarf, etc. Uh, this woman deserves to be hanged, drawn and quartered. I, I, throw her to the freaking knolls or something. I don't care. Just... As a human, speaking as representative of the human species, we'll, we'll, we'll throw her over to the dwarves, they can have her, we don't want her. Um, <laughs> so, how do you change this? How do you make this work better? For one, you have this guy be a newcomer to the camp, and you establish that he would be a newcomer from the camp. You have a throwaway line between Janai and Karam that's like, um, even now, more of our people are returning to Luxaria. We, we, we've had a group come in from the north, suffering from famine. They came here looking for full bellies and their people, and instead they find humans dictating how they live their lives. And then Janai would respond with something like, um, they're helping us, they're supporting us. In time we will be on our feet and we can live as we want to live, but for now we need to make the considerations of the humans as they ate us. And then you cut to the scene where this happens. You have the young man is setting the candle, surrounded by a bunch of others of his, uh, the group he came with. Um, maybe look him a little bit more beat up, uh, clothes a bit dirtier, that sort of thing to establish that, hey, this is one of the newcomers. And then you have the woman approach and explain, hey, we have a designated zone for that candle. Um, could you either put this one out and relight it over there or help me move this to there? And the young man um, would argue, no, the candle stays where it is, you're not moving it, the woman explain, the architect explains, it's a safety hazard, we have a place for it, just we need to move it, and then a couple of guards notice the commotion, come over, and one of them makes an offhand remark, insulting sunfires, causing a bit of a scuffle to occur, which gets the candle knocked over. Because of the candle being knocked over, relatively close to a tent, the architect acts, grabs a bucket, throws water on it, dousing the, the fire. Seeing what he believed to be his mother's guiding way to the afterlife go away, he attacks her. Being a Sunfire Elf, I'm willing to bet that stronger, faster, especially if he lights himself on fire, he would not be trying to kill the woman, but human, fighting a young, male, angry Sunfire, she is not surviving that kind of attack. She would die off screen. You would have two camps. You would have humans and sunfire aligned humans that would argue that the young man needs to suffer a punishment, the execution, prison time, whatever, for killing this woman. And then you'd have Karam's side, 
claiming that he was defending his, he was avenging his mother, who is now forced to roam the dark forever. That he is completely justified. And then Janai would have to choose between a tradition, like, have Janai j go, like, when Janai and Amaya are talking, she cast a soul into the abyss. That woman will never see her family again. She will wander alone in the dark and show that he she's genuinely conflicted by what that architect did, but the fact, but also, she didn't deserve to die for it. She was saving other lives by not letting the campfire burn out. So, this is speculation on my part, but I legitimately believe that Janai would most likely choose to ha not kill the man, um, I, or Elf. I imagine she would force him into hard labor, building the city that they're living in for the next couple of years. The humans would probably be like, okay, that's fine. Um, he's a, it's a waste of resources to kill him. Let's have him work off his debt. Uh, whereas Karam would be furious that a member of their people was punished for doing what any good Sunfire would do, that is, defend his family. And that is when Karam would finally decide, I need to get rid of Janai. And then we would have uh, its segue into that little discussion he has about that old tradition, how he's going to do it. Janai would be challenged by Karam in front of as many people as he could get, maybe in the middle of the camp, and he would make sure to have positioned his fanatics in places to where if things come to blows, like basically a show of strength that, hey, I challenge you, let's do this right now, and they would duel. I had no problems with how the duel, the actual duel went on. That, that, the way that fight goes, 100% keep it. Janai is a warrior, um... Karam gives me more of a courtier or statesman vibe. He should not be better than Janai at combat, especially since he's using fire magic against someone who's immune to fire. That was perfectly fine. But change how it ends. Karam is knocked to the ground. Janai walks away not wanting to kill him. Karam rises. Finish the challenge, or your claim is forfeit. Janai would respond with, I do not need to kill you to win. I have won. Karam would turn to the crowd and shout out about his sister, claiming that she is a blasphemer, that she has ignored tradition, that if she is willing to replace their views, that their beliefs, their fundamental ideology to please humanity. He would see, he'd probably see Janai get a little bit angry, Amaya pulling her back, telling her not to, trying to keep her from getting goaded, and that is where he would get an idea that would make him, I would argue, a better character than what we got. He would choose to let himself become a martyr. He would begin to verbally attack Amaya, arguing she is a dirty thing, that she has poisoned the mind of Janai, that, she's, that she is the reason why the Sunfires have failed to rise again. That Amaya and her filthy human ways have ruined Janai. Janai, being too angry to accept the insults against the person she loves, would attack Karam. And because this is a kid's show, you would only get shots of people's faces as she brutally kills Karam. She would have completed the challenge. She would have asserted that she is leader. But now... She's established that she would rather choose a human over her own brother. You would have Amaya and Janai talk. Janai and uh, Amaya reinforcing that you... Yes, you killed him, but he was asking for it. And on the bright side, you've asserted that you are the rightful leader. And you did it traditionally, so they should be happy. But Janai would feel conflicted about what she did and argue that no, no amount of tradition can change what I did. The final shot of the arc would be of all of the fanatics gathered around a candle they had lit for Quran. And then you would get a bit of a pan over to the tent that he was staying in, where you would see a handheld mirror that for, for a second flash with a shot of Erevos smiling before cutting to black at the end of an episode. What does this change? Well, for one, it has given... Someone died. And it has also irreversibly changed 
Janai. Yes, she she is now the queen, but she is a queen of subjects who hate her, and she had to kill her brother to assert her dominance. That is going to affect her going forward. On top of that, you now have the Sunfires are an antagonistic force who are going to act against humanity most likely to avenge their le to avenge their chosen leader Karam, or at least some of them have chosen Karam. Janai most likely has the support of large sections of the military and the people who, and more of the free thinkers, the people who understand the situation they're in, the people who are willing to push forward. But many, 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 especially the people who were like, who saw Luxaria burn, would most likely have sided with Karam. So you're going to have a schism within the Sunfires, of people who are willing to look forward and try to change, and then people who are now forcefully regressing, reg reg regressing? regressing themselves to an even more traditionalist and tribal and xenophobic society. And you've established that Erevos is more dangerous than we originally thought, because even though he's in his cage, he managed to not only impact these people, but he managed to do it, again, from within his cage. It establishes that he's got more puppets than Viren and Claudia. He manipulated Karam using his tenets of traditionalism and honor. Something that was meant to bind the Sunfires together was used to rip them apart, taking a hole into two sides. Now, you would have the diplomatic effect of a bunch of Sunfires being violent and angry. I can easily see young Sunfire Elves turning towards humanity, raiding, butchering, hunting, slaughtering for basic necessities, believing in a, um, a might makes right, that we need to take what we want to survive, Regr again, regressing to a traditionalist martial society now that they no longer have the civilization to keep them in line. They don't, Janai is not able to keep them in line because they do not respect her anymore. So then you would have humanity, which is to respond. And Ezrin would need to return to Catolis to get humanity to not respond violently, and he would need to work with Janai, Amaya, Apelli, all those other people to get the radical Sunfires in line. While you have Erevos whispering sweet nothings into the ears of Dark Mages on the side of humanity. Because as much as I hate, as much as I absolutely hate the Tales of Zadia RPG book, it establishes that there are more Dark Mages out there than Viren and Claudia. And as easily as that's probably going to get retconned at some point, because why didn't, um, what's-his-face, uh, Kasif bring one to, uh, why didn't Kasif have one? Why didn't the other humans bring their own Dark Mages to the Battle of the Storm's Fire? Viren and Claudia can't be the only ones. You could have Erevos whispering to these other Dark Mages to act against Ezrin, stirring up more violence. You would also have to see Ezrin buckle down and actually be a king. No more jelly tarts, no more paintings. He would need to be a statesman, and he would need to think hard. So, um... That is my opinion on how to redo the Luxoria arc. If you have, um, if you think I'm right, um, I'd love to hear that. Uh, if you think I'm wrong, I would love to hear that. If you think, if you're somewhere in between, I would also love to hear that. I would love to hear all your perspectives, because we grow, we tell better stories if we know where we're good and where we're bad, and what we need to do to make it better. So anyway, um, thanks for watching, have a good day, see you next time, bye.